Funding for the Hinckley Report is made possible in part by the George S. and Dolores Dore Eccles Foundation and the Cleone Peterson Eccles Endowment Fund. Tonight on the Hinckley Report, the results have been certified and Utah's election finally comes to a close. What kind of congressman will Ben McAdams be? What party shots did Mia Love take? And how are newly elected leaders already speaking out on important issues? The legislature tackles a compromise on medical marijuana. What was discussed in this week's hearings? How does the proposed legislation differ from the ballot initiative? And how are stakeholders weighing in? Good evening, and welcome to The Hinckley Report. I'm Jason Perry, director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Covering the week, we have Heidi Hatch, anchor and reporter with KUTV News, Thomas Wright, member of the Republican National Committee, and Scott Howell, former Democratic State Senator and co-chair of the Utah Debate Commission. So glad to have you all with us today. This has been a big week in politics. I wanna jump right in to the fourth congressional district. We finally know the outcome. Ben McAdams is our new uh, representative in DC. And Thomas, let's start with you because uh, we had a speech this week from Mia Love. Uh, some thought it was a concession speech. Let's talk about what that was. Uh, you know, what were some themes of this speech and was this a traditional concession speech? Definitely wasn't a traditional concession speech. The timing of it, the content, the teleprompter, some of those things weren't, uh, weren't traditional. But before I get into that, I'm just so glad that, that those commercials are over. I can finally <laughs> yes. watch TV again. <laughs> there were so many negative ads. And one of the things that, um, that, that was said was that this is the new way in Utah, and I, I disagree with that. This is not the Utah way. Um, we, we saw some great races in this state. Uh, Scott and I were co-chairs of the Utah Debate Commission. We traveled the state. We saw James Singer, mm -hmm. Sherilyn Gabani. We saw the Republicans and the Democrats treating each other with respect, debating the issues civilly, and, and they were really great debates, and they were great candidates. That's the Utah way, the vigorous debate and the consensus. Well, why was this one an outlier then? I think it just started negative, and it just it just went that way. And and uh, everywhere I went, it didn't matter if it was Republicans or Democrats. People were really uncomfortable with it. They didn't mm -hmm. like it. And um, it's too bad that at some point uh, it it didn't turn, but mm -hmm. it just got worse and worse and went all the way to the end. Heidi, you you've been talking to people on the street about this race. How how did they feel about the tone, and maybe how that maybe got into the speech? I think it just felt nasty, and I think we were all wanting those stupid shower commercials to go away. <laughs> and then when it got nasty and all the pack money got in, we were begging for the shower commercials back because they just seem that much nicer but I don't think Utah is used to these tight races and maybe because we're not used to it that's why they got so nasty so fast but I don't think people like that it's not what we want here in Utah and I think that we're hoping for more tight races like this and races where you can hear voices that matter but yeah I don't think anyone liked it like he said I just think that both sides were nasty it goes back to the tribalism and name calling's not what we're supposed to do even the governor after it was over with was like let's not do that again mm -hmm. uh, Scott I, I know you have worked on on numerous campaigns and help people work on their speeches, sometimes when they win, sometimes when they don't. Um, what, what were we thinking we would get from this speech that we maybe didn't? Because I don't think the anger disappeared there. Well, I, I'm probably the only one on the panel who lost twice to Orrin Hatch, and so I have a little experience on <laughs> concession speeches. Um, but I, what I do know, Jason, is that you have this pent-up emotion and you get very angry and you're very upset. But the decorum on this is not to let that come forward. And I like Mia. I've known her a long time. I like her husband. I like her family. And uh, what she did was really emulate Donald Trump to a degree. I mean, she was uh, uh, castigating him, but she was really mimicking him on what she said and how she said it. That just hurts. The public is over it. Like Heidi said, they want to get over it and they want to move on. And the consolatory uh, speech should have been wishing her opponent and congratulating him and saying, I'm there to help you. 
as you move through this transition. And that's what people look forward, whether they're Democrat or Republican or independent. That's what they're looking for is this healing time. But I get the frustration that she put into that, and I understand it. It's too bad that that was the sentiment when she left versus a con uh, congratulations and what can we do to work together. Uh -huh. Thomas, what did you make a, of the comments she made about President Trump? Because what Scott just said was right. Maybe, maybe you think she was kind of being a little bit like President Trump in that speech? And why did she go after him the way she did? I don't know. I can't speculate on why people say what they do and why they do. It, it's a fair question, Jason, but I, I honestly don't know. What, what I hope we learn from all this is that, that there is this visceral reaction. We're all human beings, and we all have reactions, and we all have emotions, and that is so normal. To be upset about a loss, to, to not like your opponent sometimes, those are all very natural things. But at the end of the day, we all have to kind of check those emotions, and we have to show people that that's not the Utah way, that even though we disagree and we want disagreement, we want debate, yeah. we have to treat each other with respect and we have to treat each other civilly and if we stop doing that then the whole system's lost I think it was Patrick Henry that said yeah. you know I may disagree with what you say yeah. but I will fight for your right, right to, to say, say it yeah. in fact I will die I think yeah. is what he said yeah. Yeah. for your right to say it and that, that's where we need to be we disagree it's kind of I disagree on things but we try to treat each but other I'm always respect. right so I want to dovetail on something Thomas said there that I think is real critical in this conversation um, when when you lose all these people come up to you and go, I voted for you. I voted for you. How did you lose? I voted for you. And I finally said to somebody, well, if all these people voted for me, I should have won this damn thing. You know, it was mine. I, 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 but you go through those emotions, and it's hard to, to go back and do the professional thing and the right thing. But Thomas is a spot on. We don't know why Mia did that, a, a moment of emotion uh, uh, that, uh, and passion that took over. But she, you know, she's a smart person, smart, and, and she contributed a lot to politics. And, but I think it just kind of ended that whole momentum of what she could do in the future. I remember Craig Moody, when he lost, he was the Speaker of the House, a great speaker, mm -hmm. and then he lost Congress, and he just ripped at that uh, concession speech and ripped on everybody. You never saw him back in politics mm -hmm. again. Well, that passion was in the wrong place, though. I think that people wanted to see her being passionate, and it obviously came out with the wrong spin in the end, but I think people would have maybe backed her a little more if they would have seen her, heard her early, earlier, but she hasn't been her own best advocate, so to come out swinging like that was not a good thing after the election. I think even that swinging may have been more acceptable before, people just wanted to hear from her, but she's been very absent. Even if she's been working hard in Washington, people wanted to see her, wanted to hear from her, and she just didn't do it, mm -hmm. so. I really yeah. felt like she was hitting her stride in Congress. I thought yeah. she was doing really well, and 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 I agree. Mia's a great person. If you know Mia, yeah. she's fantastic. Yeah. But, and and I want to point out why we're talking a lot about Mia. It was both sides that were negative, oh. yeah. and and it's, yeah. it wasn't just Mia Love. Yeah. This was yeah. both yeah. sides were we're complicit in this, yeah. and Utahns have to stand up and demand better. Mm -hmm. When the DCCC enters into a race, I'm telling you, their mentality of how you should handle things is completely different than the Utah way. Yeah. And I don't know if it's the same with yeah, the RNC, but boy, yeah. DCCC comes in, and I saw that in Ben's yeah. race. And what candidates say is they say, well, I have no control, I can't right. coordinate, I can't right. do anything, but they can stand up and call for it to end. Mm -hmm. And, 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 I, and I think we should hold them accountable to that. And, and if they do that and they're doing that sincerely and it's believable and, and the ads continue, then maybe we can say that it isn't their fault. But that hasn't been what's happened. And, and that's the part that's disappointing. Mm -hmm. uh, Heidi, let's check out one of your points, too, because maybe you talk about when she was maybe kind of channeling some of the anger yeah. or some of the passion. Is this setting her up to, you know, to be an advocate out there? Maybe she hits the cable TV networks. I mean, it, what kind of op opportunities do you think she might have? I can't decide yet if this is going to help her sink or swim. And I think that people were looking at her as a rising star when she was elected because we do need more female voices in the GOP and definitely um, more diversity. And I think she offered that. And I think maybe we got a taste of that in her speech when there was so much ang anger. Maybe she saw this wave of women and women of color even being elected and was like, why is Utah going against that? But I don't think it had anything to do with that. It really had to do with whether they felt like she was on their team or in their court. Mm. So I think she has to think long and hard about what she's going to do and how she's going to speak in the future because I think there can be a place for her, but I think she needs to hit reset to make it happen because as we talked about, that, that speech was nasty. I don't think anyone liked it. And what makes America great is the peaceful transition of power and being able to step back and say, I would have liked to one, I did not, and then move along. So whether she recovers or not, I don't know, 50-50 for me. Okay. I'll always be proud, though, that Utah sent the first black 
woman, Republican woman to Congress. And that said a lot about who we are as, as Republicans in Utah. That says a lot about who we are as Utahns in general. And uh, that we're inclusive, that we, we, we like diversity, we embrace diversity. And uh, I, I'll always, uh, and, and whether she runs again yeah. or not is up to her and she's probably weighing those options and she should, and that's her decision. But I'll always be really proud that Utah made that move and made that happen. Let's talk about Ben McAdams for just a minute. Scott, uh, let's go uh, to what he's going to do in Congress, sure. right? So he's already done a couple of big things, right? He joined sure. just this week uh, the Blue Dog Democrats, yep. all right? And he was one of the people that signed the letter um, opposed to Nancy Pelosi. All right, let's talk about how he's going to well, fare there. Well, my experience with Ben, he was one of my first hires when I was in the Senate. So we go back a long time. And I'll tell you, from the very beginning, I noticed that this kid had lots of potential and that he's a bright, bright young man. I think what you're going to see out of Ben is someone who's going to bring a resource to something that we've faced here in Utah for a long time. That's the homelessness issue. Ben went down there and stayed at the shelter two nights and three days and had that experience. And our largest amount of funding comes through HUD for homeless services. There is not one congressman that's been elected who has stayed at a homeless shelter underneath the covers to get really the facts of what's happening. So I think Ben is going to be a resource for us on one of our biggest challenges that we face. He's also going to be a, a bipartisan guy. He will work across the aisles. And I was so proud that he kept to his promise that he wouldn't vote for the speaker. Uh, and I know he's been criticized by a lot of Democrats, but when he makes a promise, he's going to do it. And that, to me, was a big deal. Well, what kind of implications for him? Uh, since, well, the uh, reality uh, of politics. He kept, he kept his promise. So I'm curious what is going to happen. Yeah. Well, uh, you might be on the uh, custodian committee for a long time <laughs> and uh, be in charge of cleaning the Capitol. But no, I, I think that uh, Ben is charismatic enough and smart enough that they'll recognize his talent of leadership real fast. Okay. So speaking of talent and leadership, uh, I'm kind of curious what you're hearing about Mitt Romney now that he is going to be the newest newest senator. So Heidi, he, he's had a big week too. He's, he's, he started started some, some committees where he's starting to raise funds for people. In fact, Utahns, are, it turns out 64% of them say, we want you, Mitt Romney, to be the one that pushes back on President Trump. And that is what is yet to be determined, because the question is, is he going to help and make sure that some of this Republican legislation gets passed and put that through, or will he be pushing back on the president? That's the big question. And he'll have to decide where he stands on that. Maybe he'll toe the line in both directions. But so far, at least from what we've seen him on Twitter saying, it seems like he is being kind of the doorstop and pushing back a little bit. The big question everybody's asking now, is he only there to put up a fight against President Trump and maybe try to take away? The nomination. And I think him. what oh, Heidi boy. is really saying is he going to run in 2020? Okay, fine. Let me just let me just bring it right on the table, uh, and I hope he does. Quite frankly, I, I think uh, Mitt Romney would be a, a, a great presidential candidate. I really do. Thomas, Mitt is going to be a fantastic United States senator. <laughs> We're lucky to have him. Uh, how do you replace somebody with the clout and the effectiveness of Senator Hatch? Uh, he has done so much for the state of Utah, so much for our country. He's been a statesman. He's made us proud. And how, you know, Senator uh, Hatch is going to be missed. Utah's going to feel an impact. He had a lot of power and a lot of clout, and he did a lot of great things for the country, but especially for Utah. And to replace him with Senator Romney or Senator Elect Romney will be a fantastic thing for the state of Utah. G given your, your connection to the Republican Party, uh, Paul Ryan even came out this week and said, we're looking to Mitt Romney need to be the standard bearer for the GOP. What, what, what do you make of that comment, and can he be? Mitt Romney's a leader. He's been our Republican nominee for president. People look to him. Uh, they admire him. They trust him. And uh, he's going to go back to Washington, D.C., and he's going to do what he said in the campaign. He's going he, to do what he thinks is right. And, yeah. and, and, and so far, he has done that. Okay, yeah. so we can't talk about the influence of, of Mitt Romney or the potential without talking about our senior senator, from the state, right? I'm kind of curious about that. Heidi, uh, Mike Lee, been in the press a lot this week. He's a wild man this week. And what I thought was interesting is he's very, I mean, he always sticks to his constitutional policy and always voting with the Constitution. But by sticking with the Constitution this week, a lot of people are saying, wait, are you helping President Trump now instead of maybe creating this bipartisan way to keep the Mueller investigation going? So he's put himself in an interesting position and I can't tell. I don't know. It's interesting what he's doing. Huh. Scott, yeah. is, is this uh, Mike Lee trying to flex a muscle as the senior? 
senator from Heidi nailed that he pulls out the black uh, constitutional book all the time and lays it yeah. down the line I think he's just such a purist on that that he can't really get off that and sometimes it's going to go the way we hope it would go and other times it just is out of space when he comes in and says no constitution yeah. we can't do that mm -hmm. I think he's a genuine constitutionalist and that that's the way he makes his decision we just have to live with it. Well, so even this week, Thomas, he he was the sole voice here, so yeah. just blocking a vote to force uh, 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 legislation to protect Mueller in his investigation, yeah. citing, of course, yeah. some some precedent. Right. The thing with Mike Lee is you know that Mike Lee is going to act on principle, and you know what those principles are. And so when he makes those decisions, I don't think any of us are that no. surprised. That's how he got elected. That's what he promised people he'd do, and that's what he's done. And I think with any vote of any member of Congress, it's always important to not do this tribalism thing that yeah. Heidi talked about. Let's, let's, even though we disagree with the vote of someone, yeah. in any case, let's try to look at why they voted that way. Let's try to read why they didn't, try to understand why, because it's in the why that we're going to make progress us in this country. If we're just so hung up on the result and we're hung up on this tribalism of who's right and who's wrong, we're never going to get anywhere. These are very complicated issues and people vote on them for different reasons and we should try to understand that so we can have the civil dialogue that we talked about earlier. Go ahead, Scott. Uh, art is in the eye of the beholder. The Constitution is in the eye of the beholder as well. And sometimes when he says this is the way it is, when I read it, I can think completely different. And I think that's the problem with Mike, is that it's his way or no way, and he does stick to his principles. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. But that principle is completely different than, than the way that I read the Constitution. Mm -hmm. So I think you f have to find that fine balance of what really is the best thing for our country. Mm -hmm. And I agree with uh, Thomas. The tribalism has to end. Yeah. It has to end. Whether we like it or not, they're elected, at, but we, we can't continue to fight in these very narrow Lanes. We're just living in echo chambers sometimes yeah. Yeah. where we, we seek out voices that agree with us and then they tell us we're right and then we're <laughs> right, right and, and then we then move we on think. with our day. Let's seek out voices that are different than us. Let's right. ask why. Let's ask them why they disagree with us. Let's let's get to the why so that we can try to understand each other better and find common ground. But in this world we live in with social media and blogs and 24 hour news and cable TV, you can find voices that'll tell you oh, you're yeah. right on anything you want to be right on. But, and that's a huge problem for our country. So I, I like the diversity. And and I like yeah. when somebody steps out and votes differently because I want to find out why. That's because it's, it's, he's a closet Democrat. Uh, but, <laughs> okay, but Jason, okay. the, the truth on this one is that Mueller needs to be protected. That is the bottom line because we've gone this far in that investigation and it would absolutely be paralyzing to this country if we didn't let him d finish the investigation and give his report. I think that's the bottom line. Okay. Uh, let's go to some other local issues because this coming week, we are about to have a special session, Heidi. Ah, yes. On medical marijuana. All right. So where is this going and what is the temperature right now of our legislature as it relates to the proposition that did pass in the state? It's boiling and I think we've set ourselves up for a bit of a mess right now because there were a lot of people who voted, came out and voted because of medical marijuana. They only voted because of that. And then we have a lot of people who couldn't decide if they wanted to vote or not because they were trying to listen to the counsel of the LDS church to possibly not vote for it. And then there was people who voted for it saying, I'm voting for it because they promised me in the legislature they'd have this session. If I vote for it, they'll clean it up. So now the legislature has the problem of, do we go with this compromise that we've worked out and try to clean it up? Or do we stick with the will of the people what's already voted on? And I don't know, I hope they accomplish something, but this could possibly just die and blow up on them, or they could go so far that we end up voting on it again. I don't know what's gonna happen. Okay. Go, go ahead, Thomas. Well, I just, I just think the legislature is going to step up. They heard the voice of the people. There are people that are suffering that can benefit from medical marijuana. There's a proper way to distribute medical marijuana, and there's a way that Utahns don't want it to happen. And so there's differing voices, but I think the consensus that everybody heard was that there is a place for medical marijuana in our society. The question is, how do we deliver it? How do we control it? How do we manage it? And the legislature is going to step up and make this happen. So, Scott, uh, so given this, yeah. why are so many people, including the Democrats, because they have their own potential bill uh, for the special session on this. Why is everyone so concerned that the legislature is not going to follow through with the well, I think it's a trust issue. I think they've been burned before in the past. But look, I'm all about leadership, and I've got complete confidence in Greg Hughes. I think the speaker is incredibly talented. I think he's smart. I think he's studied this for a long time. And I, I, I voted against it because I believe that Greg Hughes and our legislature would step up to the plate. Mm -hmm. They should have done it six months ago. 
And if they would have accepted the responsibility, this thing would have been solved. But I believe... And the outcome of the 4th Congressional District might have been different. 100%. Because that, yeah. let's be 100%. honest, the 4th Congressional District really was decided by Proposition 2. Yeah, it, it drove out right. uh, the voters. Uh, Thomas is exactly right. But I think that Greg and Wayne Niederhauser will, will come together and make this work. I like Wayne telling him that he's going to put the call of the Senate on there. If you don't show up for the vote, we're going to go find you and you're going to come and vote. Yeah, mm -hmm. and he yeah. took some heat for that. And I, I, I actually actually really liked that he was he was asserting himself and saying this is <laughs> a tough issue get up here and do your job I, I liked it and, <laughs> then, and then the media no offense Heidi I'm sure it I'm wasn't sorry, you well, really worst. beat him up over it and I was like wait I, he's just doing his job he's being an assertive <laughs> yeah. leader uh -huh. yeah and, and he's the really kindest mean. man you, you, you'll ever meet oh, but uh -huh. the bottom line is if you run for office you have to go vote uh -huh. you know you can't go yeah. hide that was great. yeah you have to go vote and I think people are hoping that they do get something accomplished and I think we have the extremes of the tribalism on this too where people are like it's got to be all or not nothing, but I think there really needs to be some fine tuning there. With what we voted on in the booth, uh, my family could have the coolest parties ever because we all have autoimmune disease, which is all <laughs> automatically in there. You could have six plants each. I mean, we're gardeners, but our vegetable crops next year and our Christmas parties are going to be awesome <laughs> unless something gets changed. I'm coming to your Christmas party, party Heidi. Yeah. <laughs> Put me on your list. Yeah, right? Uh, we, we talked about President Niederhauser and, and, we, and we've talked about Hughes, all right, the Speaker of the House, but they're both outgoing. Let's take just a moment to talk about the changes in our House and Senate. Uh, Brad Wilson is the new uh, Speaker of the House. Stuart Adams, the new uh, president, uh, president of the Senate. How is this going to change the flavor, Thomas, of our legislature? I don't know if it'll change it necessarily, but I think these are two very effective leaders that are revered by their colleagues, who are common sense, pragmatic people who understand the issues of the day, who want to build consensus in their caucuses and want what's best for Utah. I know them both really well. They're fantastic people. And I want to congratulate the Senate and the House uh, on the, the Republican side for electing such incredible leaders. Mm -hmm. Utah is in great hands. Mm -hmm. the Democrats have elected new leadership also and gained some seats. First time in the history Talk we about have an all-woman leadership. Uh, it is spectacular, Senator Maine and the rest of them. I, I think that what Heidi talks about and what Thomas knows, we need a, a lot more females up there to keep a good balance in dialogue and conversation. Uh, in, the, in the House, uh, Brian uh, King was elected once more, but two more women on his team. So I think it's going to change the dynamic. But what I, wa I want to reiterate something Thomas said. I, I know both Stuart and uh, Brad and, and great leaders. Uh, they will do the right things for the right reasons. And we're fortunate to have that. This state could be so partisan if they really wanted to, but when you have leadership like Brad and Stuart, and you, now you have Karen and, and uh, uh, Brian, it, I, I think you're gonna see it coming together that we haven't seen for, for a long time with the Democrats working. Okay. And, and they once he, he mentioned something that I thought was really positive with the 2018 elections, and that was that a lot of more women were elected mm -hmm. nationally, yeah. uh, locally, and I think that is fantastic. We've all worked really hard to bring more balance in this state and in this country, and it's great to see women stepping up and running and becoming elected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, women exciting. have to run to be able to win. Yeah, That's we want more and more yeah, to run. But, do. it, but yeah. don't you think it was a positive trend? Absolutely. I thought it was great. Even one, two, or three extras is good. That, that is true, and, and this is a trend that seems to be occurring across the country, not just yeah. in the state of Utah. In fact, in our, our last couple seconds, I will have to let you know, Utah finally hit 51.2% voter turnout. That's great. Finally surpassed wow. the, the United States. Exciting and sad all at the same time, 51.2, that's still failing. <laughs> Come on, we gotta step up. Was well, that not a D? Oh, it's forward a D. progress. Okay. It forward is forward progress. progress. We're going the right way. It is true. But I agree with you, we got a long way to go. We gotta, we gotta make more progress. Thomas and I have that great privilege of uh, co-chairing the Utah Debate Commission, and we're committed to increasing that number, and that's really why we're around. And I think you're gonna see some things in this next little while from the Debate Commission that is going to change that and get more, more voter participation. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you all so much for your comments today. That's it for the Hinkley Report. You may not know this, but your generous support makes programs like the Hinkley Report possible. Please take a moment to make a donation in support of the programs that you rely on. And stay tuned for a unique opportunity to be part of a studio audience for a taping of one of our shows. I'm Jason Perry. Thank you and good night.